Good morning, everyone, and welcome to George Washington University and to the Elliott School of International Affairs here in Washington, D.C. My name is Jennifer Cook, and I direct the Institute for African Studies, uh, which is a serves as a hub for discussions, debate, research, and learning on issues pertaining to Africa across multiple disciplines and across the university. Um, we're delighted to co-host today's event on the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement uh, with the Institute for International Economic Policy, which is led by Dr. James Foster. And I want to thank uh, James and his team, um, particularly Kyle Renner, for assisting us with today's event. Um, before I turn over to James for a few welcoming words, I also want to thank and welcome uh, Professor El Ghassim Wan, uh, who just joined uh, the Elliott School uh, this semester as uh, visiting Shapiro Professor of International Affairs. Um, El Ghassim comes uh, to the Elliott School from after a long career with the Organization of African Unity and its successor, the African Union. He, much of it focused on the peace and security agenda, uh, but most recently as Chief of Staff to the AU Commissioner. He was also Assistant Secretary General uh, for Peacekeeping um, at the UN, and he's uh, he's a great resource. We're so delighted to have him at the Elliott School, um, and uh, I want to thank him for helping introduce us to um, Ambassador Machanga, today's featured guest, uh, and for being with us here today. So thank you, El Ghassim. Uh, let me turn first to uh, to James to say a few words of welcome from the IIEP, and then we'll uh, turn to today's panel and an introduction of the topic. So, James. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm James Foster, co-director of the Institute for International Economic Policy of the Elliott School of International Affairs. It is our pleasure to be co-sponsoring today's important event on the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Now, I bet you are asking, what is the Institute for International Economic Policy? First and foremost, IIEP is a research institute that serves as a catalyst for high quality, multidisciplinary, nonpartisan research on policy issues surrounding economic globalization. We have four signature initiatives, global economic governance, climate change in developing countries, extreme poverty, and US-China economic relations. Second, we are a collection of scholars across many disciplines with significant research portfolios of our own. Recent topics addressed by IIEP scholars include democratization in Africa, health messaging in Senegal, ethnic divides in Kenya, post-COVID-19 challenges in Africa. My own approach to measuring poverty multidimensionally has been adopted by many countries, including Mozambique, Nigeria, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, Angola, and just this year, Ghana. Finally, we produce many events each year, including our annual IMF Regional Economic Outlook for Africa, co-sponsored with IMF's Africa Department, as well as multiple events with the Institute for African Studies. Next week, on Wednesday, the IMF will come to Elliott to present their latest World Economic Outlook, while on Friday, the World Bank's chief economist will join us for a keynote address in our 13th annual US-China conference. I look forward to seeing you at one of our events. Or if you miss one, just go to our YouTube channel, IIEPGW, and view it at your leisure. Thank you. So today we're focusing on the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement uh, in the era of COVID-19. Um, the uh, ACFTA um, is hugely important for Africa. Uh, it is ambitious and it has the potential uh, to transform Africa's future economic trajectory. Creating a single market, Overcoming the fragmentation of Africa and Africa's small economies through better and deeper integration has been an ambition and an aspiration 
uh, really that dates back decades to the earliest years of Africa's post-independence era. Uh, but the last two years with the signing of agreement and then the, the going into force of the agreement in July of 2019 um, has really brought us a major step closer to um, fulfilling um, that goal. And now the crisis of COVID-19 has thrown up big new challenges for the implementation uh, and the momentum of the agreement, uh, potential delays. Um, but at the same time, the crisis has really, particularly the long-term economic uh, impacts that are, are forecasted, um, the crisis has underscored the urgency of getting this right and keeping the momentum up on the ACFTA. Um, if Africa is going to draw the kind of investment it needs, raise its competitive edge in uh, global markets, and diversify its economic base to pull out of the current crisis and to thrive. Um, we have a fantastic panel today. Um, we're so delighted to and honored to welcome Ambassador Albert Muchanga. Uh, Ambassador Muchanga is the African Union Commissioner for Trade and Industry at the AU Commission. Uh, so the person responsible for kind of uh, the policies, the mechanisms and driving the momentum forward of the ACFTA. Um, and he has done that ably even through, uh, through this uh, current crisis. Um, he's calling from his home country of Zambia, uh, calling from Lusaka, uh, where he was a long-standing member of the um, uh, Department of uh, International Affairs, the Foreign Service. He served as ambassador in Ethiopia and to the African Union, has long-term expertise on regional integration, on international economic policy analysis, um, and again, as being a champion of the ACFTA, we are delighted to have you here, Ambassador Muchanga, so welcome. Also joining us on the panel um, is uh, two people, are two people who are well known in Washington policy circles, in US Africa policy, and in particularly in US Africa trade policy issues. We have uh, Flores L. Lizaire, who is uh, president and CEO of the Corporate Council on Africa, so which works to encourage and support U.S. businesses uh, engaging in Africa. Um, so Flory brings to this conversation um, a, kind of the U.S. private sector perspective. But Flory also served for many years with the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative uh, most recently as uh, Assistant U.S. Trade Representative for Africa. So she led policy toward Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, including uh, overseeing implementation of the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act. Um, she is on the Advisory um, Committee on Sub-Saharan Africa at the Exim Bank. She's on the uh, Advisory Council of the Millennium Challenge Corporation. Um, Flory, we're delighted to have you here and thank you for making the time to, to join us today. And finally, we have uh, Tony Carroll, who is Vice President uh, of Manchester Trade. Uh, Tony has 35 years plus as a corporate lawyer and business uh, advisor. Much of his career has been focused on Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, dating from his days as a Peace Corps volunteer in Botswana in the 1970s. Uh, Tony has done a, a lot of work, uh, a huge portfolio, a lot of work on extractive industries, on pharmaceuticals, on technologies, understanding the impacts of Chinese, China's engagement in Africa. Again, one of those, uh, one of the leading lights behind the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act. Um, so we are just delighted to have you both here. We're going to turn to Ambassador Muchanga and then to our panelists, and we're going to leave ample time uh, for question and answer with the audience. So welcome to you all. Welcome to our panelists. And uh, Ambassador Muchanga, the floor is yours. Now, uh, we have agreed that um, there should be a special summit on 5th of December this year to get the final reports uh, from us on uh, where we are in the readiness to start trading. And the, our 
target date for start of trading under the African Continental Free Trade Area is the 1st of January 2021. So right now, as I'm speaking, uh, the senior trade officials are preparing for a meeting of ministers of trade to be held on the 27th to give them a brief on where we are. And the ministers are going to have another two meetings because they want us to sustain the momentum of preparations. Basically, a free trade area is where, we, is where there is a complete liberalization of trade. And that come from, can come from a number of sources, uh, one of which is the liberalization of trading goods. And we've agreed on a minimum uh, level of ambition of 90% of liberalization of trading goods. The other 10% is going to be adjusted over a period of time, divided uh, among what are considered to be sensitive products and the restricted products. But uh, that is going to be uh, come to 100% over a period of time. Then in trading services, uh, we are in the process of negotiating specific commitments on the trading services. Uh, we have identified five priorities. Uh, sectors uh, such as finance, transport and communication, business services, uh, and the tourism, among others. And then, in order to facilitate a, a trade that really promotes competition, we have to go out with the uh, transshipment. And for this reason, uh, we are also uh, undertaking work on a regime on rules of origin uh, so that uh, uh, only products which are produced in the territory are able to trade duty-free across the region. And of course, sometimes when you remove non-tariff barriers, uh, when you remove tariff barriers, let's say, when you remove tariff barriers, non-tariff barriers also come into place. So we have created an online monitoring mechanism on the, uh, monitoring, uh, uh, reporting, and elimination of non-tariff barriers. That one is fully operational now, and it's going to be one of the instruments that are going to be handed over to, uh, to the Secretary General of the African Continental Retail Area uh, when we have the summit on the 5th of December. And of course, facilitation of the implementation of the agreement is going to be done by the Secretariat which is going to be, uh, actually, it's already there, located in Accra, Ghana. Uh, so we've appointed a chief um, a secretary general, the chief executive officer. His name is Wamkele Mene from South Africa. And uh, he is in the process now of um, uh, appointing the first set of directors. There's going to be a director on the trading uh, goods, a director on trading services, and the two support directors one for finance, the other one for administration. And then there are going to be secondments from uh, uh, the African Union Commission, the member states, and other st uh, strategic partners uh, of personnel to the sector so that uh, they are ready to start implementing the agreement when it is underway on the 1st of January next year. And uh, he's also working with the police organs of the African Union uh, to negotiate a long-term structure, uh, organizational structure of the sectoriate. And when that is done, then it, it, we go take it to the budgetary processes so that uh, we are able to recruit the full number of uh, personnel that is required. So basically, this is where we are. Uh, the momentum has been established. And of course, we are better to ensure that the momentum is sustained we have uh, come up with an arrangement where uh, one of the heads of state and the government, the president of Niger, has been appointed as the leader or champion of the African continent of Rotterdam area. So I'm in close contact with him to ensure that the momentum is sustained. And uh, we are confident that uh, in the remaining period, we are going to have a very successful summit. And uh, a few days before the summit, we're going to have the third edition of the African Continental Free Trade Area Business Forum, where we're going to uh, invite the business people from all over the world and those from Africa, so that uh, they're able to interact with the policymakers, and they're also able to interact among themselves so that they can do 
both business to business networking and business to government networking. Those who are ready can undertake transactions because we know that some of them are already in contact. So we expect some, uh, uh, some transactions to take place. You used the word fragmentation. That is true. When you look at the African economies, they've got small populations and they've got small uh, uh, economic sizes. And that makes them very, very uncompetitive. So for them really to establish uh, competitiveness, the term we are using is defragmentation, so that we create one, Africa, uh, one African market. And that uh, market is going to be uh, a, a, an aggregated population of 1.2 uh, seven billion people. And in the next 10 years, that is going to rise to about 1.7 billion people. And that is going to generate large economies of scale, large economies of scope, and in the process is going to attract investments. Where are the challenges? Well, the first one is um, the COVID-19. It disrupted the physical negotiations. So uh, right now, the member states uh, are undertaking virtual negotiations. The next ch challenge is uh, um, how to sustain the momentum. Because when we start trading on 1st of January next year, we need to have a wide range of products and services that can be traded. And we need these to be very competitive so that uh, substantially the market registers the increase uh, in the, uh, trading across uh, Africa. And of course, related to that is the need for the business people to see this as a huge opportunity. So we are sensitizing the business people to say, we are opening up a large market. So try now to link up with the other business people to uh, partnerships across uh, uh, Africa so that uh, you are able to supply to the scale of uh, the market. And of course, for us, this is a starting point. The free trade area is a starting point. After that, we need to move to the African Customs Union. And that's where a lot of uh, uh, sovereignty issues are like to, to come up. So that is a basic challenge, but uh, we are undertaking a readiness assessment towards uh, the African uh, Customs Union. So these are the three uh, uh, key uh, challenges. Priorities, our first priority is to ensure that uh, we have a very successful summit on the 5th of December. And uh, the next one is to ensure that uh, come 1st of January, we are able to start uh, trading. So this is where we are. And I think uh, uh, in order to respect time, let me stop here. But during question and answer, more details can emerge. Once again, thank you for inviting me. We uh, thank you. That was perfect. And we will circle back because I know there will be uh, lots of questions because lots of threads to uh, explore there. What I'd like to do is turn to the Flory and then to Tony uh, for uh, some words. Then, then we'll have a few uh, questions from the organizers and then open it up for questions and answers. So, Flory, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Jennifer, uh, James, uh, thanks to you all for putting this important event together from GW. We've been a, a partner with uh, um, uh, both programs at GW and always pleased that Corporate Council on Africa can contribute to important conversations like this one. Greetings to Commissioner Mushanga. It is so good to see you. And um, uh, we uh, we go way back. Um, he has been um, uh, tremendous in terms of leadership, getting um, the African continental free trade area to where it is now. And his leadership is critical in going forward. We've been pleased to host him um, in uh, events of our own, as well as joint events with the Chamber of Commerce. Um, CCA has also been um, very pleased that uh, we hosted um, uh, AU Commission staff uh, for about a week to talk about um, the specifics of the uh, African continental free trade area um, and how they're moving forward, um, not only in uh, trade and goods, everybody focuses on that, but also services um, and uh, many of the other uh, uh, phase one issues and looking to the phase two issues, uh, competition, et cetera, which are really critical. So I just want to, um, uh, in, 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 in greeting and opening, um, commend the African Union, um, especially in terms of um, how they've managed keeping the AFCFTA going forward in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
um, you know, they've had to battle the dual impact of COVID, both on the health of the African people, as well as on the livelihoods of, 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 of African people and the economies. And this has been a, a double tsunami uh, that has uh, washed through Africa. Imagine, um, you know, what's happened to tourism, et cetera. Um, I myself was last on the continent in, in February. It's seven months later. You know, someone who travels regularly to the continent, our, our members of CCA travel regularly. Um, this has been, you know, really uh, devastating um, for, um, for us, for business, for the Africans in particular. Um, but, um, you know, notwithstanding that, uh, I think all of us recognize that AFCFTA um, is indeed a game changer. And um, we have to make sure that we don't lose ground. There are a few things, I think they've lost a little bit of momentum, but um, the commissioner just noted that, you know, that's picking back up again. Um, I have to also say that I've heard um, uh, complaints about some backsliding in terms of um, uh, trade liberalization and the ability to move goods um, across the borders within Africa as a result of COVID. Um, there's some things that have happened in, in, in response to that. Um, and so we're hoping that with the uh, a sort of re-energized momentum uh, that the commissioner just spoke about that some of that, uh, I'm, I'm calling it backsliding, but maybe there's another term for it, um, will, will, will be reversed. Um, uh, from the point of view of why it's important, um, obviously, this will be the largest um, uh, free trade area in the world ever. Um, the commissioner has already given all of the, you know, in terms of the, the, the number of people, 1.7 million people, the size of that economy. And it's just really critical that, um, uh, uh, you know, the AFCFTA move forward. But if I could just sort of a little hook on this COVID, um, is also an opportunity. We've seen what has happened to global supply chains and all of that. Um, it has um, highlighted the need for um, greater regional integration, greater collaboration um, across the African countries. Um, and it may actually provide some new opportunities um, for the Africans in um, particular supply chains, health um, uh, equipment, PPE, uh, pharmaceuticals, um, manufacturing, which, you know, everybody knows my history on, on AGOA and um, all of that. Um, so uh, they say there's always a, a silver lining in the cloud, um, and I'm an optimist by nature. So I believe that um, despite uh, uh, some of the backsliding, some, despite uh, the impact of COVID, um, we would never ask for it again, but to take advantage of it, I think the Africans will go forward and it will be critical for intra-African trade, for regional supply chains, and for the Africans being competitive in global supply chains, maybe, um, frankly, replacing some of the products that are being made in um, China and Asian countries and seeing those now produced in Africa. And I'm very much in favor of that. Um, for others, including U.S. companies um, who are trading and investing in Africa, um, this larger, more integrated, I like that term, defragmented um, uh, um, African market, um, you know, poses a lot of opportunities. And so we just have to really focus on that. You know, you have the naysayers who are like, oh, it'll never happen. But there are a lot of people who are focused on this and they know that it's going to make a difference for their bottom lines as companies. They're looking at the harmonization of rules and regulations the economies of scale that are being created, the elimination of red tape um, and, 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 and reduction of barriers to both cross-border uh, trade in Africa and, and global trade. Um, and you know, all of these are, are necessary in order to incentivize um, trade with and investment in African uh, uh, countries and economies in manufacturing. Um, this is important when, when companies are looking at like, where do I go in Africa and why should I go to Africa? The why is AFCFTA, you've got a huge market. The where is now it doesn't matter so much because if you if you set up in Zambia, you'll have access to you know everywhere. If you set up in Morocco, you have access to everywhere. If you set up in you know South Africa, you can all across the continent. So companies can actually 
rethink their business models. Um, let me end by just touching very briefly, Jennifer had asked me um, when I did this on um, US policies and, and, and sort of the way that will work. And I'll, I'll just say a little bit about that. I think that there are some things that have happened, some initiatives that have happened under the Trump administration, which, you know, I, I don't want to be political, but I think we have to talk about things. Exxon Bank, a seven-year reauthorization, it's never had a seven-year uh, reauthorization. It's now up and functioning. The transition of OPIC, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, to be DFC, and the doubling of the resources they have from 29 billion to 60 billion, and the ability to do equity um, loans. This is important. Um, you know, this all of or whole of government approach that's been launched under Prosper Africa. Um, I think these are all things that, you know, regardless of what happens here in the U.S. on November 3rd. Uh, my view is that um, these kinds of, um, of uh, critical programs that have focused on supporting U.S. businesses in Africa, helping um, companies to be able to operate in Africa, to work with the Africans um, uh, collaboratively, to offer the deals that other um, uh, companies from other countries have been able to offer that U.S. companies were not necessarily able to offer. I personally think that all of these will continue regardless of, of, of who's in the White House um, in the U.S. Um, and I think any um, initiatives that are contributing to U.S.-Africa trade and investment, um, I think, um, I can't imagine that there will be anyone in the White House who will not want to see that and will not want to um, support that. Um, there are some areas where there may be questions about exactly how we'll move forward. For example, the U.S.-Kenya FTA, um, I think, you know, th there may end up being some questions there. But again, I think that, um, you know, and businesses think that this will be beneficial. Um, and I think at the end of the day, if we can make sure that we are supporting AFC-FTA, supporting regional integration, not undermining um, uh, intra-African trade, um, then um, a bilateral FTA could also uh, very well be um, uh, meaningful and support the overall approach to Africa that goes beyond aid um, and takes AGOA to the next uh, uh, level. And so I'll end uh, in there. But thank you very much for the opportunity to, to share those thoughts and look forward to uh, hearing Tony and any other uh, engagement with uh, the commissioner and all of you. Great. Thank you so much, Flory. Um, that, that was great. Um, Tony, let's turn to you. Um, Ambassador Mushanga, um, Mauro and Shani to you. Uh, nice to see you again. And thank you for doing what really is difficult work in getting this um, to where we are. Congratulations to you. Um, things are different. I mean, we I'm old enough to remember the Lagos plan of action and the Abuja 1991 agreement, uh, which uh, also ambitiously called for greater economic integration in Africa, and, and frankly, those uh, didn't produce a lot. We now are in a position to really bring this uh, ambitiously forward and have more tools to work with. And one of the big differences uh, is, uh, since those agreements, is the role, increasing role of services in the African economies. Um, what we've seen is uh, many of the African con economies now have a predominance of services as part of their GDP. And I think what, what one of the restrictions or one of the inhibit, inhibitions about moving forward and taking advantage of the dynamicism of the services agreements is greater emphasis on uh, communications infrastructure. And I think I was just looking at uh, presenting a paper just this week, looking at comparative data uh, access costs in, a, in, in Africa. And frankly, there, there needs to be more price competition and there needs to be more investment for the services economies to thrive. So that's my first point. Uh, my second point is, apart from ICT, uh, we really need to see, as we saw in the passage of AGOA, which Flory and I worked so uh, diligently on, uh, we saw the re reply, the supply response as being not what we had hoped it to be. And I think we all know that a big part of that supply response has been the absence of infrastructure. And one of the uh, data points that I've seized upon in the last uh, few weeks is the uh, small portion of African infrastructure at both the national and regional level, which is funded through private infrastructure, private investment. 
uh, up to 85% of African infrastructure is, is provided on a national, on a bilateral and a plurilateral sort of public basis. And there just isn't enough, I think, um, opportunity and, and ambition and participation in private investment in infrastructure. And that's a place where we really need to move into. And as Flory pointed out, the uh, new um, uh, Development Finance Corporation of the US government uh, is going to bring new tools. Just in the last quarter of this year, they've made commitments of $3.6 billion of investment into Africa. Boy, I can remember in the 1980s and 90s that we were all happy that the Development Fund of Africa was $100 million. This is serious money. And, and 60 billion is, is what we're looking at. Uh, I, even last week in the launch of this new strategy, we've seen figures up to $75 billion. This is clearly a whole different generation of commitment from the US to be involved in, in playing a meaningful role. And the one area, of course, I think that really can make a difference is in infrastructure investment. But as in all regional uh, trade agreements and trade agreements of any nature, there are going to be political winners and losers. Are there going to be winners and losers economically? The countries that we've seen over the years in Southeast Asia, in Europe, and in North America that benefit are those economies that have a certain degree of sophistication. They're going to be the economies that are probably first going to optimize on the uh, abilities or the opportunities created by the free trade agreement. And there's going to have to be some sort of political management for some of the losers in this. And I think if, you know, in East Africa, Kenya will certainly be a country that will step forward because of its sophistication. The largest share of South African trade is within Africa now. The growing portion of South African engagement with the continent is, is the fastest and most optimistic segment in the South African export economy. And I believe that will continue to flourish. But there's, you know, ancient and, you know, rivalries among those uh, groupings that have created uh, problems in the past, and I don't think they're gonna go away in the future. So, Ambassador, part of the me message and part of the mission that you and the new uh, architecture of this agreement are going to have to do is try to ameliorate some of these inevitable political frictions and economic frictions that'll arise with the articulation of this new agreement. I think as uh, Flory noted uh, in the COVID environment, and uh, shall we say an increasing uh, nationalism uh, from uh, developed countries in terms of value chains, Africa is going to have to be more ambitious in terms of launching its regional value chains. Uh, I'm comforted by seeing a, a growth in investment across borders and some nascent uh, movement toward building regional value chains. They're going to have to be a lot more ambitious. I know in Botswana they're assembling uh, wire harnesses uh, for automobiles and sending them to South Africa for final assembly by OEMs. That's a good and increasing uh, opportunity, but with the closure of borders and COVID, getting trucks across from Botswana into South Africa, and they're in a common customs union, has been problematic. So we, as you rightly point out, sir, we need to continue to focus on the non-tariff barriers because that's going to, if anything's going to put a spanner in the works on uh, the regional integration, it's going to be going to be that. And lastly. Uh, let me just say that this week uh, during the IMF meetings, there was a riveting discussion on the emergence of uh, digital currency. You know, we, we, uh, I've been in Africa working in Africa since the mid 1970s. And, you know, the, the, the whole issue of currency convertibility over valuation of certain currencies. Uh, I was in Botswana when they left the RAND monetary union. And I remember the impacts of that. I think that the opportunities for digital currency and the idea of developing and articulating new platforms. And, and, and making your financial institutions more ambition, more ambitious about getting into regional trade are going to be opportunities and challenges. And as an implication to U.S. government, because I know there's been uh, some pushback, even our government of the Federal Reserve in that uh, uh, session said, look, there's a lot of issues pertaining to, to, to due diligence and scrutiny and, and cryptocurrency uh, regulation that still need to be resolved. But clearly, I think we're looking at with the growth of M-Pesa, the growth of loaded value, the facilitation of, and the accelerated uh, velocity of money will make this process work all the better. And this is just one of those tools that I think can make that happen. So I'm delighted to have had this uh, brief opportunity to comment. Let me say in closing that my colleague, Steve Landy, and your good friend, Erastus Wencha, have put together a paper, which will be on the Manchester Trade website, which I think will go into greater detail about some of the opportunities uh, that move forward. Steve 
everything I know about rules of origin and, and tariff uh, notifications is from Steve. And I think uh, with Erastus, who, as you know, was the uh, your colleague for many years, I think you'll find this to be a good uh, uh, contribution to thought leadership in the field. So, Jennifer and Professor Foster, thank you very much. I look forward to being on your panel or at your event this week. And greetings from the beautiful Adirondacks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you to all three. What a fabulous set of kind of complimentary presentations. So um, really excellent. Um, I have questions, but I'm going to turn first to uh, James and to uh, Juan to see if they have some initial uh, comments and then I'll ask a question and we've, we've already got things coming through from the um, audience. So, um, yeah, uh, James, Great. do you want to start? Sure uh, and given my background and what I do, you won't be surprised with the question. But uh, I just want to congratulate uh, you, Ambassador, on your uh, progress to date. This is uh, amazing. And I want to thank the panel for your insight. Uh, my question is, how do we best ensure that this advancement in trade and economic growth translates into improvement in the lives of the continent's poor? How do we make sure that this doesn't exacerbate inequality in a tremendous way we've seen in the US and we've seen across the world. How do we best lay the groundwork for uh, this growth to be inclusive? And uh, shall we take, uh, maybe we'll go with Juan and then I'll ask a question. We'll come back to the panel. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Jennifer uh, and Albert. Happy to see you uh, uh, and hope all is going well. Uh, and thanks for the presentation. Of course, many thanks to uh, to the other panelists. Uh, my question is, is as follows. As you know, Albert, the integration agenda of the continent rests on three pillars. You have the CFTA, and a lot of progress has been made. But you have two other pillars, which often people don't speak about. It's the free movement of people. Uh, you know, there is a protocol on the free movement of people right of establishment and right of residence, which was adopted in Akhil Fat at the same time as the CFT in Kigali, and for which, unfortunately, the ratification level is extremely low, if my information is correct, even though close to 30 or over 30 countries have signed, only two or one, I'm not sure, or three, I'm not quite certain now, have ratified, and the first was uh, Rwanda. Uh, the second pillar, the other pillar, which is complementary, the single African airport market. Uh, I think one of the panelists spoke about communication. And of course, when you look at the cost of uh, air transportation, the content is just staggering. You know, it's not affordable to people. And the single African air transport market has, in actual fact, been on the agenda since the early 90s when the Yamoussoukro decision was adopted. Thank God it was launched in January 2018. Uh, I know that about 30 countries are part of it. I just wanted to find out the extent to which the other two pillars are progressing because they are really mutually reinforcing with the CFT. Uh, the other question is not really a question, it's a remark, uh, and apologies for taking a bit long. Uh, and I'm glad that Tony spoke about the, uh, the, uh, uh, on the, uh, on the African economic community. Uh, well, of course, you know, you have the, uh, Lagos plan of action, uh, you have the final act of Lagos, there was the Morovia decisions that were taken at the, you know, towards the end of the 70s. Uh, and I know, of course, Albert will provide some elements, but at least I had the opportunity of being at the AU when the CFTA was, well, key elements were nego negotiated and when the agreement was adopted in Kigali. I see one big difference, one big difference, and which in my view works well, is the speed with which the countries have been able to negotiate such a complex agreement. And I still remember the signing ceremony in Kigali. I think there was, I would say, a spirit which I have not seen in the AU literally since the early 2000s when the African Union was launched. So, you know, I'm not saying that it will be an easy process. And Tony, you're absolutely right. There will be in the immediate countries that would lose, others that would benefit. But I think the spirit that presided over the adoption of the CFTA has been quite unique. If I comp if I place it, you know, in the context of the history of the AU since it was launched in 2000, and that, and in my view, it works well in terms of prospect. I will stop here. Thank you so much. 
Great, excellent. Um, just mine, and it, it, it echoes uh, James's question to some extent. Tony talked about kind of the geopolitical uh, challenges uh, ahead. Um, you know, and James talked about the very poor um, who often don't have much of a political voice. Um, the other segment are kind of workers and unions and so forth. And I'm, I'm, I, I wonder on the poor, on the workers who may be affected, on the states that get left behind because everyone wants to flock to the sophisticated economic hubs. Um, you know, is there a kind of a continental approach to that? Is it, are the domestic implications of this simply left to the countries? And does potentially the U.S. and the international community more broadly have a potentially constructive role to play in that? Um, so let's turn back to the panel, and then we've got some questions from the audience. We'll come back uh, for a round from from the audience. Um, so should we start with Albert on that? Uh, and Commissioner Muchanga, I don't know that we're on a first name basis, but. <laughs> Because without inclusiveness, it will be very, very difficult to get sustained by in. And we are addressing that at a number of levels. The first one is to encourage all the countries to set up national committees for the African continental free trade area, drawing representation from the executive arm of government, the legislative arm of government, the private sector, labor, the youth, women, cross-border traders, among others, so that they are aware of what is going on and they are able to indicate the, uh, the impact that it has on their daily operations. Then we are also setting up what we call the adjustment facility of the African continental free trade area. Uh, we are now drafting the articles of agreement. And that is going to provide adjustments for countries as well as individuals, as well as uh, businesses. Uh, we don't know how much is going to uh, come up as um, the initial capital, but as a start, we have been working with the African Export Import Bank to come up with the, a transitional financing mechanism of one billion US dollars. So that is going to assist the countries. Then at the productive level, and this is where now the issue of uh, inclusiveness uh, among countries comes in. We are collaborating with the, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, UNIDO, to come up with the, a regional value chain mapping uh, exercise so that we are able to cover all the 55 African Union member states and be able to know what each and every one of them can supply to the rest of the market at either intermediate or final goods levels. Now, when that work has been done, it also enables to come up with the investment promotion activities so that the, the region of value chain development program translates into actual investments. And it also enables to identify areas where there can be specialization. Because if uh, there's a uncontrolled competition, then there'll be a race to the bottom. And the, uh, again, businesses will suffer and even the individuals. So that needs to be brought into operation. Uh, other element of inclusiveness is uh, to promote uh, the development of the agricultural sector. It's a sector which has a lot of demand for, for, for labor and also promote self-employment, especially among the youth. And to this end, uh, we are working with the private sector to come up with a, a youth startup competition so that uh, we are able to get about 150 youth who can be role models to the other African youth so that they can generate their own businesses. Uh, before I yield the floor, the issue raised by one is very uh, a, a true. In order for the African continental free trade area to, to work, we need to facilitate the free movement of people. And hence, the protocol on the free movement of people, right of establishment and right of residence and we need to develop a single African air transport market. So administrative and legal processes are underway to ensure that these two documents come into operation. But the main uh, 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 energizer to the process will be the rapid economic recovery of the African countries uh, out of the, the COVID-19. If we can ensure that they recover very swiftly, 
then it, there's going to be enhanced investments across the region and the, that is going to give confidence for countries to facilitate the free movement of people and that's also going to give confidence to the private sector to uh, really take advantage of the single African air transport market. Uh, I, I'll, I'll stop here so that the other colleagues also come in. Okay, uh, well, we've got uh, participants. You are welcome to share a, uh, a comment in the chat and we've got a few or you can raise your hand. Um, we have uh, from Hank Cohen a couple of questions. Uh, the first is, uh, what role will agriculture play in the trade agreement? And the second is, um, to what extent are African entrepreneurs preparing to take advantage of the coming free trade treaty uh, by investing in manufacturing? This goes to Flory's point um, for sale uh, to this new vast market. Um, so uh, those are an, an initial two, if there are uh, additional. Uh, Kyle will be this one from James uh, Chisenga. Countries such as the USA have started bilateral trade arrangements with individual African countries. Are rules under these bilateral trade agreements not going to negate the AFSTA uh, uh, multilateralism? And, and Flory touched on that, but I think that is still a big question for many of us. Um, so why don't we take these these three uh, agriculture are African entrepreneurs prepared to to take advantage of the manufacturing opportunities and then this question uh, in terms of U.S. policy on the bilateral uh, agreements and their impact. Uh, so commissioner again. No problem. <laughs> I'll answer the, 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 the agriculture is very very important. Because uh, uh, one of our focus areas is to industrialize agriculture, make agriculture more productive, as productive as the industrial sector, and uh, also try to mechanize it in the process. And uh, when we've done that, we are going to promote uh, agro processing. And uh, when that is done, uh, we'll be able to transform Africa from a net food importer to a net food exporter. So it's uh, one of the key areas. And uh, within the agreement, uh, the agreement is up to the African continent of today. It's one of the areas where there's going to be uh, increased collaboration among countries. Uh, and it's, uh, so agriculture is uh, quite, uh, quite important. The bilateral agreements, normally I prefer not to answer this issue because it's very, very sensitive. But I've been very, very frank with the, the US administration, just like I've been very frank with the, the European Union that uh, we are moving Africa towards defragmentation. Now, if you go into bilateral trade agreements, you are sustaining fragmentation. And the one you are sustaining fragmentation, you make the African economies remain small and uncompetitive. And when you do that, you are not able to attract large scale investments. And the, the American business sector has told us very frankly that for us to invest, we need a large market space. And we were giving them a large market space by creating the African continental free trade area. We've been assured that it's not going to undermine the African continental free trade area, meaning the bilateral trade agreement. We are yet to see the impact, but uh, my point has been very, 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 very clear. We are in the process of defragmenting Africa and we do not want any uh, uh, elements that can sustain the fragmentation of Africa. The business sector has responded very, very well to uh, what we are doing. Uh, there is a, a textile and clothing manufacturers association uh, which is working with, with us to ensure that uh, uh, they are able to reach the entire market. There is a federation of uh, pharmaceutical uh, producers, uh, products of producers across Africa, which is working with us. Then the manufacturers have established what they call the Pan-African Manufacturers Federation, so that they are able to use that platform to interact with governments, uh, uh, to advocate for more incentives, so that they are able to increase the score investments and other private sector entities, the mining associations have set up an African uh, mining association uh, are coming up 
And the, the auditors and accountants are also coming up with the, the Pan-African uh, uh, Association. Uh, the tourism sector already have uh, a Pan-African uh, Tourism Association. So there has been a very, very positive response from the business uh, 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 community. And uh, before we go into the third edition of the African Continental Free Trade Business uh, Forum, we are going to have an audience or conversation involving the ministers responsible for trade and the African private sector. The ministers are going to tell the African private sector what they've done to create the African continental free area and the readiness to have it start trading on 1st of January uh, 2021. And the business people are expected to tell the ministers how ready they are to scale up investments so that they are able to reach a large market space of 1.27 billion people. So there's a lot of expectation and enthusiasm, and we are confident that once we start uh, trading, then the confidence levels are going to increase further. Thank you. It's Laurie and Tony, do you want to talk about the bilateral um, uh, agreements and kind of the internal workings of those? Mm -hmm. Um, so before I do that, I do want to just touch on the importance of um, value addition in the agricultural sector in Africa. For um, Africa, I think, to be able to both um, supply its own needs um, and also to be able to supply to others, um, taking advantage of its huge agricultural um, uh, 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 sector, um, all the land that's there, et cetera. Um, I think that agro processing is, is, is really the key. And I personally have seen a lot of um, uh, um, facilities where they're there, for example, in fact, in Zambia, I remember taking the former USTR to a factory um, that was uh, partly US owned where they were processing tomatoes and canning them and shipping them to the U.S. And I believe that that um, that uh, facility is no longer open. And the point is, is that the whole value chain was not really um, linked up efficiently, you know, getting the tomatoes, et cetera, when it was needed. Um, so it, there's a lot of potential in Africa for agro processing. Um, and um, I, I just am pleased that, you know, the commissioner talked about that. On, on bilateral agreements, um, I, I think, frankly, that, um, uh, you know, this administration, how can I put it, this administration has been very focused on bilateral deals that, you know, less so on plurilateral deals um, uh, uh, and, 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 and even um, uh, multilateral, you know, WTO and so forth. Um, we saw, you know, what happened on TPP. So there's been a real push in terms of bilateral trade agreements. And I think the Kenya USFTA reflected that. Uh, um, I also think though, that there's a genuine interest that started even in a previous administration under President Obama. Um, and when I was still at USTR to see how can we go beyond AGOA. AGOA is a, you know, one way unilateral. Every year the Africans have to be approved um, you know, uh, uh, go through the renewal process. Um, and there's a lot more, in my view, there's a lot more certainty that investors can have when they know that there's a permanent uh, agreement that's in place and where um, their investments are not at risk. And to be frank, we have about five years left, September 30th um, of, of this year, we have five years from that date for AGOA, and we don't know what will happen to AGOA. And we don't know whether the US Congress will extend it. So um, I, I just think that um, uh, if, if, if we work with some of the champions throughout the continent and we set up a model for um, a, a more uh, a permanent, fuller relationship uh, between the US and its African partners, rather than just depending on AGOA, I, I think that's good. And I think that it can also spur investment. And the last thing that I would say is, because I've seen this, I saw it in Asia <clears throat> when I was working in the APEC region and went to China all the time, and I'm seeing some of it in Africa, is that you know AGOA has always been focused on the final products 
um, that are, are produced. But uh, if 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 investing if having an F <laughs> let me just put it this way, if having an FTA with Kenya can actually pull in other countries in Africa into a particular value chain. And even if they never make the final products, then they're in it. So let me just use an example. If Lesotho um, uh, is producing mirrors for automobiles in South Africa, if South Africa had an FTA with the US, that would be advantageous because Lesotho is producing um, the, the, the mirrors, you know, someone else, um, Botswana is producing, you know, inputs um, in Kenya. Um, Kenya's in a number of, of value chains. If they can pull in other countries in the EAC region so that maybe somebody is making, you know, they have, a, they're the largest exporter of apparel to the US under AGOA. And, um, but many of the inputs come from China and Asian countries at the moment. <clears throat> so what if we could use Kenya's growing um, uh, apparel sector and have zippers made in Zambia and buttons made in, you know, um, uh, you know, Ghana or wherever, you know, and have the other Africans drawn into a value chain. So then everybody grows. It's not just Kenya that grows. And that's, that's something that I've seen in other regions, something that I think is very possible in Africa. And if indeed we're going to go forward, with quote unquote bilateral FTAs like the Kenya one, I personally think that that is the way to make sure that it supports regional integration and it supports the, the growth of regional value chains. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> just let me add a couple comments on the uh, organizational structure for the private sector to inform this process going forward. I mean, I have, I have a lot that I could add on my comments on the FTA, but I think Flory's covered those uh, very, very well. I think on, um, I don't think the the Continental Free Trade Agreement uh, Secretary General needs to create a new institutional structure to harmonize mining. I think the um, the African Mining Vision from the Africa Union, which support from the World Bank, has made uh, some real progress in making sure that mining hasn't doesn't continue to be a race to the bottom, which it has been, unfortunately, in Africa. I mean, you have some high standards like Botswana and uh, and then some very low standards in countries that I won't name. I think that the idea of, of making uh, mining contribute more to the economies and, and have a more healthy social operating license between the countries and the companies and the communities in which they operate is uh, a, a discussion that has gone a long ways in the last decade. And I think that uh, the... Uh, you know, the new entity should borrow upon those, those uh, practices that have been developed rather than create a new uh, uh, in institution. On the, um, I'm, I'm encouraged by the comment of the organization of a pharmaceutical association, but I've also been following for at least the last decade the effort of trying to harmonize the registration of medicines across Africa. And frankly, we just haven't been ambitious enough. There's been sort of mutual recognition agreements among the East African community that largely aren't observed. And I think you're not going to attract significant scale investment in the industry because this is a very capital intensive industry until we're able to move goods across borders and register products more freely. I'm not as a, if I was a, a pharmaceutical research based company, I'm not going to invest in one single market. I'm going to go to Africa so that I can access if I was making a drug that I thought was helpful to a larger community of, of, of patients in Africa, I'd wanna be able to access that. So I think that um, we need to not only create the organizational structure of a better association of pharmaceutical producers, but we also need to have a lot more ambition in terms of uh, the registration process of medicines. So, I mean, I, I could comment more on the FDA, but uh, time doesn't so permit. And thank you very much for allowing me to be on this panel. Great. Um, we are, uh, I, with your indulgence, I'd like to just take a couple more questions, if that's okay with James, with uh, Commissioner Wachanga and panelists. I know no they have to go, but just because we did start late, uh, I'd like to. Um, first, we have a question from um, Annabel Gonzalez, who is a uh, former senior director at the World Bank's Practice and Trade on Competitiveness, former Minister of Trade in Costa Rica. So, a 
Um, and uh, An Annabelle asked, congratulations, and thanks on a great event. Will negotiations on tariff liberalization, liberalization and rules of origin conclude by the end of this year so that firms may start training under the CFTA as of January 2021, or will this date be extended? So that's one. <clears throat> and we have two questions about EU engagement uh in, in in this uh one asks what is the engagement of, of the eu uh hank cohen asks uh is it true that eu countries will automatically have data, duty free entry for their exports to all of africa under the free trade agreement as a result of the lome convention it's uh, taking us back a few years <laughs> uh and then um any role for the from Lakeisha Harrison, an adjunct professor here at, at, at the Elliott School, what role for the African diaspora to play in this? So we do have some additional questions, but I think we'll we'll have to come back to the panel there and then and then wrap up. Um, so I'm gonna start with, with uh, Flory and Jordi, and then we can give um, Commissioner Muchanda the final word. Any word on the diaspora, you think, uh, Tony, Flory? Well, um, I, I think we've seen kind of um, for many years that uh, there is um, a, a natural, I guess, connection uh, between small um, minority owned, diaspora owned, uh, women owned, and you know, women could be all women, but um, uh, here in the US and small businesses um, in Africa. And I know at CCA, we have members that are, 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 are large multinationals. Everyone knows that, but we also have probably more than 50% of our members are uh, uh, mid-sized and SMEs. And so we think there's a lot of potential for connecting um, the diaspora and minority uh, owned businesses here in the US to the African market, educating them about AFCFTA, and what the opportunities are and helping them um, to position themselves alongside uh, African companies to be competitive in the global economy going forward, especially, um, you know, as the AFCFTA uh, actually is implemented and takes off, um, we have to remember the SMEs are the drivers of economic growth, not only in Africa, but <laughs> actually here in the US as well. So, you know, we look forward to supporting those kinds of connections and, you know, I'm hoping I can follow up with the commissioner on some things that maybe um, CCA might be able to do collaboratively with them to promote SME, diaspora, minority, you know, global equity, everybody is talking about. This is all, this all links together, at least in, in, in uh, my mind. Um, and so I think that um, there are a lot of things that can be done to support uh, those kinds of business linkages. The business linkages at the highest levels with the largest companies, uh, I think happens kind of naturally, but I think to support it at the, you know, for the smaller businesses, it, it really has to be, um, um, there has to be a lot of capacity building. Thank you. Um, I think there needs to be a greater awareness, not only among African businesses, but American businesses of the opportunities that this presents. You know, we have very, and, and as Flory points out, we have terrific uh, diaspora networks in the United States. And I think what, what could be uh, uh, ambassador, a, a good 2021 objective would be to try to reach out to those communities in some way to inform and educate them about the opportunities that present. Because as Flory points out, there, there's a lot of, I mean, we are all within, well, I'm in the Adirondacks, but mo mostly I'm within the Beltway and we certainly have an, a, you know, a certain received knowledge about these things. But when you go to Seattle, I'm on the board of a, of a largely diaspora-led organiz business organization out there, Los Angeles, several in Texas. These are organizations that I think could be really uh, excited about this new opportunity, and I and I hope that the CCA and other business organizations and U.S. government, which has in its new articulation of its a strategy for Africa, will have more outreach to U.S. businesses about the opportunities. And then I'm I'm going to borrow a page from Steve Landy on the EU engagement issue that Hank uh, and I and I I think there's not been enough communication uh, between good allies between the United States and the EU. I'm trying to harmonize our approaches toward Africa so that we're not competing against each other and that we have some sort of, we allow enough space for Africa 
to do what it needs to do to organize itself from a trading standpoint and then come in when that some of that process has gone forward rather than to try to jump in and take advantage of a dynamic opportunity before it's really uh, materialized in, in any sort of meaningful way. Uh, again, um, thank you very much, Jennifer and Ambassador and my good friend, Flory, for, for allowing me to participate today. Thank you, Tony. So to Commissioner Muchanga, we'll give the last word and uh, perhaps to Annabelle's question about will, will the trade uh, liberalization rules and rules of origin be, be ready by the end of the year? Thank you very much. Yes, the rules of origin are going to be ready by the end of the year. Uh, like I indicated in my opening statement, there are three um, key tasks to be finalized by December this year, actually by end of November. The first one is on the regime on rules of origin. Uh, I think one of the key issue, key issues remaining there is how to treat the special economic zones in the, the free trade uh, uh, area. Uh, but uh, we, are we are very, very certain that uh, they will be, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll be ready. Uh, the diaspora is always invited to our business forum. And uh, we have uh, people participating from the US and the, uh, the Caribbean and the, even in Canada. And one of the members of the African diaspora from Canada uh, uh, has set up uh, what is called the, the Sokuku uh, electronic commerce platform. Uh, and in the Arabic and the Swahili, Sokuku means the common market. So it's already operating. Uh, so they are very much involved. Now, when we are establishing the, um, the, the free trade area, the Preferential trading regime is going to be restricted to the participating member states. It means that it will be restricted to the 55 African Union member states, those who have signed and ratified the agreement. It's not going to automatically flow to third parties. Uh, the EU uh, would have um, economic partnership agreements uh, with, the, uh, with the Africa and the uh, other preferential trading schemes. But that is not going to give them automatic access to the free trade agreement. It just to conform to the established uh, regime on rules of origin. And we have also indicated uh, that uh, we would like to see a situation where the economic partnership agreements do not undermine the African continental free trade area, just like we have indicated to that at the US administration, that we would not like to see the model uh, but if a uh, bilateral free trade agreement undermine the African continental free trade area uh, uh, agreement. So uh, we, ho we are uh, hoping that this is going to be uh, uh, respected. Now, the best problem I have about the model bilateral, model bilateral free trade agreement that has been negotiated is that in the first country that is going to negotiate with the US administration uh, is going to come up with a, a model agreement. Now, what will stop the US administration from going to the other countries to say, we negotiated with this first country, so you also have to accept these conditions. Now, if that arises, what it means is that um, the other countries that are not negotiating right now have given their collective sovereignty to the country, the African countries that is negotiating right, right now. So that way it undermines the process of sovereignty. But these are issues that have to be discussed uh, over time. But I'll end by saying that uh, I found the discussion very, 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 uh, very, very insightful. And we have quite uh, learned quite a lot. And I'm very happy that there's a lot of interest in the African continental free on the African continental free trade area from, uh, from the American audience. And uh, certainly, if at any time you wish us to come and give you some more uh, thoughts on it, uh, feel free to invite us and we'll be able to participate. So thank you very much for the invitation. Absolutely. And um, thank you uh, so much, uh, Commissioner, and to Tony and Flory, sir, for such uh, your really substantive comments. I've learned a great deal. I hope our audience has as well. Apologies again for the technical glitches. Um, really, we are all rooting for the success of the agreement. And um, I think there's a lot to tease out in the challenges ahead, but also the opportunities, a lot for the United States to do, as Tony and Flory have pointed out, and kind of 
getting people aware of the opportunities, the diaspora links and so forth. Um, again, you have a, a lot of champions uh, rooting for you, and um, we would love to have you back as, you, as we kind of kind of go forward in the year and, and um, things develop, new challenges arise, new opportunities. So thank you, Commissioner. Thank you uh, to James, uh, to Kyle, who helped with this, and, and the Institute for International Economic Policy to um, Juan uh, for um, helping put this together and uh, to our audience for very thoughtful questions, comments, and for um, joining us today. So enjoy the Adirondacks, Tony, enjoy Lusaka and Flory's on a road trip. So <laughs> uh, thank you to all of you.